I'm Terry Scofidio, the CEO of CBR Youth Connect. CBR has been around a long time across Colorado, um, and our goal, no matter what we're doing, is to strengthen families across the state. Whether it's a youth, a family, however you define that, that's always what our services are intended for. We provide services across the state, so we see people in their environment, we are not center-based, we do everything in their homes and communities. And knowing the diversity and the complexity of who we see, we provide mentoring, which is individualized one-on-one -on -one for an hour or two with a youth. We do all sorts of family visitation, supervised, therapeutic, monitored. We do intensive home-based services, so families who need more. So it may be a couple hours a week, it may be six hours a week. It's all individualized. My name is Sister Michael Dolores Allegri. I'm a Sister of Charity of Love and Worth. In Colorado, I began being a foster parent in 1999. And I was first certified with Catholic Charities. So, that makes it, what, 22 years that I have been a foster parent. Departments of Human Services, the judicial system, any of those, behavioral health providers, all see people on paper. And they decide, oh, you know what, I think they could benefit from mentoring from CBR. Well, has anyone asked the kid? Has anyone asked mom or dad? We have systems and processes and we have families. Systems and processes only work to a point when you're dealing, dealing with real people in real life situations. So yes, we have to comply, we have to report, we have to do all that. But more importantly, we have to reach the family where they are and what they think is gonna help. It took forever for me to see my kids after the allegations that were put on me and when they took my kids when I was at work. Uh, that was really hard because I literally had to schedule certain days, two days out of the week for, I think it was an hour. And just having someone sit there and write what you're saying on a constant rate. Your son, my son's over there jumping on the couch. I'm trying to tell him not to jump on the couch. He's writing it down, making sure I say it the right way. And me, I'm straightforward. Like, get your little butt down. I ain't playing. You, and, you know, he writes that down. I've said it once and I'll say it again, it was the worst day of my life. Um, you kind of had a feeling that they were going to do it when the DHS worker was in the room, but I remember just telling my boys, especially my two older boys, like, enjoy your adventure. I didn't want them to go into this thinking that they were at fault. I didn't want them to go into this thinking that they could have done something differently or to hate the people that were taking them. Um, but I knew that my life was changing and that my worst fear had come true. They called us and said, we have an emergency placement. And I was like, well, we're not a revolving door because, you know, our hearts are a kiddo comes into our house, they're gonna stay here. Um, and, but they're like, well, we really, it's an emergency. The people that we were placing her with, uh, we found out their certification wasn't finalized. I mean, she'd already done the whole, uh, visits the and visits and, and was packed to move in with these people that day. Within two hours, Lucy, they, Lucy moved in. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah. okay. And Sparkly, eyed little four-year-old, just oh, oh, she was so cute. Crap. But you could see the trauma in her face. Yeah. You knew. Yeah. I mean, she just had this haunted look in her eyes all the time. Lucy was having some struggles when she was in, you know, later in fifth grade, early sixth grade. Um, it started in fifth grade. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Basically, about the time she was 12, 11, 12, and the way we like to describe it is like once puberty set in, that trauma just 
was slamming her and she didn't know how to deal with it. I did pick up another case right after the first one. So I had a case I was getting closed on probation, about to get discharged, picked up another case for felony, misdemeanors, picked up for the felony, whatever. Um, and then also, it was going through that and DA, we were trying to close the case for 50-50 parenting. I think we were like six months to a year in, but they kept postponing it. And I kept getting feedback from like three different people. Uh, we're gonna extend it because we don't know if you're going to jail or this and that. I'm like, what does that have to do with anything? Like they're stable in the house. It's like, nobody said anything about going into jail, but mother was obviously making allegations again, I'm going to prison. And honestly, I was looking at prison time. I was looking at 15 to 32 years. I got a lawyer, uh, fought it. You know, I paid like seven to eight thousand dollars, including all the stuff that I had already had to pay for for classes, for DV classes, all kinds of stuff, all kinds of petty stuff that you know CPS put on me. Help with living, they didn't help me. They said I had to go through my probation. Going through my probation. Uh, I would have to get a uh, well, an approval or a referral and put it in for housing, which if I do apply for housing, then they don't put me nowhere except back in negative stuff because all you're doing is you're, you're living around a bunch of felons and cons and, and then you get, and on top of that, you got, you got uh, child molesters. Honestly, I would never do that. So, and it's not even about pride. It's like, why would I go to a negative environment well, I'm trying to get out of a negative environment, period. It's like the system sets you up for failure. Yeah, you plead guilty to a felony, this and that, but at the end of the day, can I get a place? No. Can I get a decent job? No. But DHS made everything harder on my whole life, you know, a struggle. I've been broke since, I would say, 2019 to now. You know, I'm finally coming up. When I first had my son, really I didn't have much of a support system. I was raised by a Marine Corps major, um, and we were taught that we didn't need help. We could do everything we needed to do on our own. And so really my support system only looked like my dad, who constantly told me, you do not need help, you don't need my support, you should be able to do this on your own. With me, even to get help now in this system where I'm supposed to have so many resources and so many supports, it's a two month process to get a gas card for my daily trip to Greeley for the therapy that I'm required to go to through DHS. And it's, it scares me moving forward because what happens when my boys come home and I need help? Do I have to go sit down at the Department of Health and Human Services for 12 hours with three little babies and hopefully get some paperwork and an appointment in two weeks for food stamps? DHS only wants to help those who are actively in the system. They are reactive ahead of proactive. I work 60 hours a week. I take an 18 credit course load. I take care of my kids. I take care of my dogs. I live, all, I, I do all of these things while also trying to find a second job and trying to afford things. The ability for me to be, for me to reach out for help without fearing that my kids were gonna be taken for me, without fearing a case opening against me. Um, I feel like that would have been much more helpful um, than just waiting and waiting and waiting until something bad did happen. And we've been given more resources to help those situations than we would have never ended up in this place to begin with. So, so basically with the school and with her therapist, everybody was recommending um, minimum of day treatment services. Minimum. Um, and I, we applied to Medicaid and they denied it. They had, Medicaid literally denied it within three days. And it took me two months to get an appeal filed because it was so, such a mess. 
Medicaid did not have things together. They, they weren't, it wasn't very helpful. So I did the, I got the, the, did not, the, um, the appeal done and it took them a while to say, oh yeah, she does have day treatment. She can't have day treatment. But by that time, school, school was out. out. Mm -hmm. And her, because her IEP did not indicate that she required extended school year, there was nothing, nobody, nobody could do anything about it. The school system could do anything, nothing. We were just, maybe next year, well, fall, right. you can have day treatment. In the meantime, Lucy's personality just split apart. It was, it escalated, the running escalated, everything started escalating. I called the county, because I'm like, I've got this kid out here, and I, we don't know what to do with her. And, that's how the county got reinvolved so, with Lucy. Yeah, so the county left us like we were waiting for final, final um, information from Medicaid and from Office of Beaver Health. And she was in Jefferson Hills and they said don't, when they call, Jefferson Hills calls you, do not go pick her up, leave her and just wait. And so we've got your back, we don't do anything. They were, the county is literally waiting to see if we could get Medicaid to pay to get her into day treatment, and they denied again. And it was like, here you go, here's our here's our kid. We can't, and so we had to go to court. And I have to tell you, that was the most traumatic experience of my of our life as a couple is being in a courtroom and having our parental and, rights and have, our, have have a county take over partial guardianship of our child, and we didn't have a. We didn't have good support mechanism from the county um, initially. Um, just lots of battles, and uh, we had, I think we had 15 people on the team, and nobody was doing their job correctly. I was literally making phone calls and being a case manager mm -hmm. instead of a parent at that time. Yeah, we just need to figure out, as a state, as I mean, as as. <sighs> I guess it's nationwide, but the whole mental health system for kids, because there's a stigma that needs to be overcome too around childhood mental health. No, yes, they are resilient. Some of them just can't do it on their own. They just need a little extra boost. I've been in the field well over 30 years. I've run schools, I've run acute psychiatric facilities for youth, residential programs, preschools, outpatient clinics. It doesn't matter whether you're in New York, in the middle of the United States, in Colorado, the needs of families are the same. And the idea is how do you identify them and get them in? Too often kids end up in treatment facilities because nobody addressed it early on, because they wanted to save money because they had a goal that we're gonna fix you in six months because that's what the state, the funder, is rating us on. It's irrelevant. You can't fix someone overnight. You can't fix someone in six months who has been abused and mistreated for 15 years. I have seen incredible things done to children because families grew up that way. Mom or dad grew up that way. There is no mom or dad. We need to look at the whole picture and again, understand why someone is acting and reacting the way they are and helping them again with the root cause. A family that has uh, drugs involved or domestic violence or uh, homelessness or um, the, the parent grew up in foster care. Then, and so the parent works their 90 day plan or whatever, then the county should make a commitment to that parent that, you know, you're gonna hate us, but we're gonna be here once a week or twice a week or whatever, just to make sure things are going okay for you and to check in with your kids. And then it becomes a partnership, not a top down. And that they're working together to improve the lives of the family. And, and I think our mistake is we want to give them services and when they no longer need the services, we think we're done. 
How do you know when somebody no longer needs a service? When that person can start giving back the same service. The other resource that I was very thankful for, but I feel like we should have had a long time ago, was CBR Youth Connect, um, which is basically parenting-based services. And um, we were given a visitation supervisor who quite literally became the only human being I trusted in this entire case and still trust to this day in the, with the care of my boys. Um, and she's really what gave me the motivation. She gave me the motivation to put myself first and make myself better and become a better parent so that I could protect and take care of my boys. Having um, the other services now involved with her, it's just, it's been really nice. And, and we have a family therapist. She has her mentor that she loves, adores spending time with her. I mean, it's just. She has her dance therapy and, and, and DHS helped us get all those services, those wraparound services for her. We can't provide the level of behavioral health care that is needed in this state to provide the basic care for true behavioral health versus all the, the drug problems that come in and still keep the taxes really low. There's got to be a give and take. Something's got to give. There's a new behavioral health administration. They're looking at new ways to fund. Fortunately for COVID, we're now getting a lot more money in and the state saying, where do we need to address those issues? And if we can continue to address those issues, you know, we work with all the rays. We work with Beacon and Signal. We work with the state things. And they're all saying, we have these dollars. How do we reach the families? We take our families out of the environment they're in and give them a chance at a new beginning to say, we're gonna pull you and your family out. We're gonna get you stable housing. We're gonna link you with jobs. We're gonna bring in wraparound services. We're gonna bring in providers who can help you train you. And we don't know what that's gonna look like yet. Is it a one or two year program that we take you here and we bring you over the bridge so you've crossed it and you know you can support yourself and your family and you've got the housing stability and the job stability and the food stability so you can move on. Rose-colored glasses, yes, but that's why I'm in the field I'm in. I never say they can't. In fact, I've riled staff up and said, I don't wanna hear it. I don't care how difficult the kids are. I don't care how difficult the families are. It's our job. They're looking to us to say, how do we help? Are there gonna be times we can't? Yes because we can't be everything to everybody, but there are other people who can. And that's our whole goal. Let's get the family what they need and let us worry about the funding and the financing and, and all the systems and processes and give them what they need and educate them to the systems, which are very, very complicated. And how do they address that? And how do they not be afraid to ask for help? None of us likes to ask for help. We all think we can do it on our own until we can't.